हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाइजूज आई एस बाइजूज आई एस में आपका बहुत बहुत स्वागत है आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू आर डूइंग वेल यस सो टुडे बीइंग अ संडे द लास्ट डे ऑफ द फाइनेंशियल ईयर आई होप ऑल ऑफ यू हैव हैड अ गुड फाइनेंशियल ईयर आई मीन फाइनेंशियल ईयर इज मोर फॉर द पीपल हु आर वर्किंग फॉर स्टूडेंट्स इट्स मोर अबाउट इट्स मोर अबाउट यू नो हैविंग अ गुड अकेडमिक ईयर which i feel is more important than having a good financial year so this is today's newspaper extremely important and very interesting articles when we talk about the newspaper per se so look at the topics which are to be covered in today's newspaper we'll be talking about the citizenship amendment act the rules are silent on fate of rejected applicants this is a newer angle that has been explored this time which no law actually the law on citizenship amendment does not address followed by that the ip act change yet to aid msmes micro small and medium enterprises tropical cyclones of higher intensity demand a newer category this is a geography article and it will be important for understanding the environmental impact and its intensity on the existing tropical cyclones why is unemployment high among the youth and lastly will global forest expansion hit the tribals we are looking at these articles and these articles are important from multiple topics and multiple papers i would be giving you the reference i got uh, so a feedback from multiple students about how do we look at these articles or how <coughs> how should we make sure that we apply the article knowledge in the right fashion all right so i give the papers and the topic for which this particular article is relevant you can apply it over here and that is something which is important because its application is more important than just studying studying anyone can do but whatever you have studied that needs to be applied in life in in the examination and that is what actually matters so look at this article a newer take on citizenship amendment act caa caa debate doesn't seem to end multiple things happening on the caa rules and regulations basis let's understand what is something that has not been addressed or the challenges about the caa that people will face from now let's understand we are talking about granting citizenship citizenship is to be granted to people from six communities or six religious backgrounds six communities and six religious backgrounds <coughs> and these six religious backgrounds people who migrated to india migrated to india not in a legal fashion which means without a visa without valid documents before the cut off date which was 31st of december 2014 the people from these six religious backgrounds who entered india before this date and they entered india without legal documents from three countries afghanistan pakistan bangladesh abp or abb they would be granted indian citizenship according to the citizenship amendment act which means the latest amendment that has been done that would be granting the citizenship to people from these three countries belonging to these six religions now what is the issue this is a very interesting thing we have to understand the issue the issue is that there are people from certain backgrounds who obviously belong to these six religious backgrounds they migrated long back they migrated post the mukti bahini movement <coughs> they migrated post um uh, post the formation of bangladesh and they were hindus who were living in the erstwhile east pakistan and the newer bangladesh they migrated to west bengal parts of bihar assam etc they are called people hailing from a particular community called the matua community so it's termed as the matua community wherever you hear this term you should be knowing this for prelims as well as mains 
the people hailing from Batua community, they basically belong to the very, very poor class or they are very, very poor and they are Hindus and they were there as a part of separation. They somehow were included in the region which, which went to Pakistan according to the separation treaty, separation act and post that it was converted into Bangladesh. So those people, they belong to a lower caste which is why the result of which was that they were always poor. So this entire movement became in order to give them identity and their leader actually they, it, they got, uh, he, got him, he got them together in order to make a certain community to provide them with a certain <clears throat> to provide them with a certain identity. That identity was given to them, it was termed as the Matua community. So these people from Matua community, they came to India, they migrated to India after the Mukti Bahini movement, after liberation of Bangladesh. When they migrated to India after liberation of Bangladesh, this is something that happened at that point in time and something that basically became a part of their identity. Now, according to this law, Citizenship Amendment Act, people from the Matua community should be granted citizenship because they migrated before this date, they migrated from Bangladesh and um, they migrated to India without legal and valid documents and they belong to one of these religions. So, the issue is that these people from this community, when they apply for citizenship, when they apply for citizenship, their citizenship application might get rejected. They fear that the citizenship application might get rejected. What does it mean? It basically means that they might not be, what the people from this community think, they might not be able to fulfill the requirements of the documents which are asked or which are requested by the, by the committee or by the authority, by the institution under CAA. So if their application gets rejected, then what recourse do they have? Is there, a, is there a recourse? Is there a help? Is there a grievance redressal mechanism for people like this? Now try to understand. We are going to step ahead. Till date we were talking about granting citizenship. Now we are talking about if a person applies for citizenship and his or her application gets rejected, what recourse do they have? Can they go to someone? Do, is there any grievance redressal mechanism as a part of this? This is a highly, highly important, important angle. So here let me tell you, the authority which has been in task or which has been given the task of granting citizenship and to verify the papers is called as the Empowered Committee. Empowered Committee has been granted the responsibility to look at what has been received and the application that has been given by these people who want the citizenship whether, though, whether they are genuine people who actually want citizenship, they actually migrated to India and they actually hail from one of these three countries. So all these papers have to be verified. Their claims have to be verified. Matua community thinks that their papers would be rejected or if their papers are rejected, then what would happen? So I hope you are able to understand we are going a step ahead. In the fear of getting rejected, so many people did not even apply they did not even apply for citizenship. They did not apply for citizenship. So many people did not apply for citizenship. This is what happened. Now let's come to the article. What does it state? Potential impact on Matua community. Many Matua community members entered India decades ago. Lack of proper documents, which they obviously they don't have because they came in very pressing circumstances. That could lead to a rejection. So they may, they might not be able to prove that they are Hindu or they belong to one of these six religions. Probably they are not able to prove that they come from Bangladesh. Are you getting the point? So that might lead to rejection. This is the uncertainty which is there under the Citizenship Amendment Act because Citizenship Amendment Act does not give clarity on what if the application gets rejected. Because till date they are living a life in oblivion, right? If they apply and they get rejected, then they'll come within the eyes of the authority. Then so they definitely would be deported. Are you getting the point? They would be deported or they might be detained. They would be put behind bars. So empowered committee's authority is to 
understand <coughs> is to take these applications into consideration and verify the documents. So this is the final authority of according citizenship under CAA and the silence on review process in the acts and rules. The review process has been given as this particular part. This is the empowered committee's authority. Looking at this, understanding this, this is the biggest concern of the potential aspirants that what if they get rejected? Will they be detained? Will they be deported? This is the biggest fear. So should they keep living their life the way they were living earlier? Let's understand the legal perspective behind the rejection review. The legal perspective is that there is no legal recourse given to them. Insight from a Sam based lawyer, possibility of filing a writ petition before the high court if review is rejected, then you need to file a writ petition. Writs are basically, you would have heard of habeas corpus, mandamus, certiorari, these are the writs which are there for the protection of the person who thinks that the law is violative of whatever has been, whatever should have been given to that person. Review to be done by the empowered committee. So these two things have to be understood, but the entire point is that they have to approach a lawyer. The lawyer would be filing a writ petition. These people don't understand um, uh, the legal proceedings. How do they go through and for how long would they go through? Till the time legal proceedings would go on, would they be detained? Are you getting the point? So this is something that is a legal perspective that would be impacting on the basis of, on the basis of rejection. And the only reason for rejection is lack of documentation. If they don't have proper documentation. Nine specific documents from government authorities needed to support claims. And these claims are basically you have to prove that you have come from one of the three countries, you belong to a certain religion, when did you migrate to India, where were you living. So applicants required to declare country of origin and date of entry into India. This is what has to be declared. If they are not able to produce these documents, their application might get rejected. Which is what gets us to a very, very pertinent question. The intent of Citizenship Amendment Act. Citizenship Amendment Act wanted to, it had the intent to grant citizenship to people belonging to these religions coming from the countries uh, uh, where they were persecuted because of exploitation, because of countries being made on the basis of religion. So the intent was to grant citizenship or to help out. But on the contrary, is CAA actually helping out or CAA is actually becoming a nightmare for them because their application, if gets rejected, then they would be detained. So people would start thinking it was better we were living the way that we were living earlier. Why did we apply and we attracted problems for ourselves? So the necessity of documents as per rules is something that becomes a contrast that you require documents in order to prove your citizenship or in order to prove your things. and it is being given and CA is granting citizenship to, to those people who are uh, uh, who are illegal immigrants. So one, you are illegal. Two, if you are illegal, you are not able to, you are not able to, uh, 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 you, are, you are not able to prove or you are required to prove that you came in into India on this particular date, you hail from this religion, etc, etc. So these are the concerns by the Matua leader, by the Matua community. Now, this might be the concern with one of the communities which has come to light. Probably this is a concern with people from other religions as well, like from the Jain, Sikh, um, um, a Buddhist religion, Christians, etc. It is with respect to them too. So this is something which has been done, which has been implemented. Now coming to the next article. Next article focuses upon governance. So this is again for GS2 purposes. Now, what has been done with respect to <coughs> the MSME industry or helping out the MSME industry? When I say helping out the MSME industry, it's something which is highly important. Reason being, the micro, small and medium enterprise sector has to basically do what? It has to basically apply or fall in the category of a, of a certain definition. So first, I will explain what the MSME community is or what are MSMEs, what is micro, small and medium enterprise. And then we'll discuss, we'll come to the article as to what was desired and what has been achieved. About MSME, micro, small and medium enterprise. So we are talking about micro, small and medium enterprise. The division of micro, small and medium enterprise is on the basis of investment, 
how much money have you invested and what is your turnover which means what is your gross sales how much did you earn this is what has been done this is what has been stated so investment and turnover if your investment in the business is up to 1 crore then it would be called as a micro industry small micro small uh, not small micro industry uh, smaller than small that is called micro or if your turnover is less than 5 crores turnover is less than 5 crores investment is less than 1 crore it would be termed as micro industry followed by that you would be called small if your investment is less than 10 crores and turnover is less than 50 crores turnover is less than 50 crores or up to 50 crores and investment is up to 10 crores it would be called a small industry lastly medium industry investment is 20 crores and turnover is 100 crores so this is how the difference between micro small and medium enterprise has been done on the basis of what on the basis of services and manufacturing so if you have a manufacturing unit then you see how much money have you invested or what is your turnover if you have a service industry service industry doesn't require much investment you look at mostly turnover what is the turnover so this is the division between micro small and medium enterprise micro small and medium enterprise is led through msme d act it is regulated by micro small and medium enterprise development act of 2006 this is something that has been done this law and the definition of msme these limits and the entire definition it keeps on changing so what the definition that used to be followed till five till eight years back ten years back this is not the same definition which means the criteria for micro small and medium enterprise it has become different this is what you need to remember this is what you need to memorize you'll be surprised to know that micro small and medium enterprise starts very small at a micro level and then it prospectively grows the firms the companies which are falling within this bracket are over 57 million there are 57 million msmes in india 57 million means 5.7 crore msmes in india 5.7 crore which is what gets us to a very very interesting question and that is that how much employment does the MSME industry create? MSME industry creates an employment of, if you consider that there are 5.7 crores MSMEs in India, if one MSME on an average employs two people, only two people, not more than that, averagely two people, then the kind of employment that we are looking at is anywhere between 11.5 to 12 crores, 120 million people, 12 crore people. These many people are employed as a part of micro small and medium enterprise sector this sector was excluded from the banking credit it was excluded from any kind of benefit that government of india provided to let's say uh, a marginal industry or a marginal family or a marginal uh, farmer to the agricultural community or any kind of other community MSME was always ignored as in it wasn't considered that there have to be certain benefits that should be given to the MSME industry too. The government of India never thought about this. Which is what led to creation of Mudra Bank to support the MSME credit that Mudra Bank would be providing loans to the MSME industry, micro, small and medium enterprise sector. In addition to that, when we talk about the Mudra Bank, in addition to Mudra Bank or in addition to MSME Industries, there was another problem that was observed. And that problem was the turnaround time. The turnaround time uh, where the MSME has to basically understand that in how much time would you be able to deliver goods? Like let's say I place an order today. In how many days would I get my order delivered? That is called turnaround time. This turnaround time depends on working capital there with the MSME industry. Working capital means money to run the business. Money to run the business. This is money to run the day-to-day -day business. Whatever is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. You need raw material, you need labor, you need factory. All these are the working capital expenses. So MSME industry does not have good access to working capital or does not have timely access to working capital because 
there are payment delays there are payment delays payment delays are that when if i am an msme i have provided a certain good if you don't give me money i don't have working capital i cannot produce the good and i cannot turn around the next order on time because i don't have the money so the so this payment is a big problem the payment delays are a big problem this problem is to be solved by automation and transparency so government of india wanted to solve the problem of the delays in payments excessively as a part of this particular logic so it had announced as a part of the income tax act i repeat it had announced the government of india as a part of income tax act had announced what what would we do if the msme industry has turnover or profit up to a certain bracket up to a certain limit government of india or central board of direct taxes will not charge any tax on the income earned by the msme this is something that they would do which was a which is a very positive thing in addition to it the things would be automated or the entire process of msme providing good good reaching and payment coming would be automated and transparent so there is no gray area of providing things so this would lead to what it would lead to attraction of the payment on time the payment delay would not be done and this is something which is highly important have a look at this income tax act section 43 bh payments to udyam udyam uh, pardon my uh, uh, the the typo payments to udyam registered micro and small and medium industry so udyam is a portal on which msmes get registered must be made within stipulated time for deduction so udyam registered portal the payments to udyam registered portal msme should be made in within stipulated time failure to make timely payments results in taxation of the payment as income if you do not make the payment or if you do not account for the payment that payment is of the micro small and medium industry then it would attract tax it would attract tax and they have to basically they are exempt from tax so this is basically done in order to pose a limit on the people who are actually doing what uh, uh, people who are actually running the msme industry so in order to ensure timely payment to micro and small enterprises and service to service units what was done that there should be implementation of more transparency in the payment of payment of 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 the things in the payment of the entire objective so now what is supposed to be told now look at this what is the entire issue if your payment gets delayed if your payment gets delayed you have already accounted that this is my income whatever income if i have sold goods worth 100 rupees i have accounted my income so my income is known but my payment is not received my payment is not received if i don't receive my payment on time then this 100 rupees will be taxable which means income tax act would impose tax on this 100 rupees this is a problem so you have to receive the payment on time in order to receive payment on time transparency has been introduced the system has been more transparent now this is this has been done income tax act has been amended and this has been done to basically solve a problem this is solving a problem for the msme industry in order to solve a problem which means this is a solution it has created another problem it has created another problem and that another problem is that now people who earlier used to pay used to pay a little late all right who used to pay a little late who used to do delayed payments like for example i am a buyer i used to pay after 2 months now i will stop buying from the msme are you getting the point this is another problem so in so basically government is thinking that payment cycle would become better it would become more transparent it would become better but on the other hand it it will also lead to this problem where people if they don't get this much time to pay then they might not place the order it would eventually decrease the business of the msme unit msmes ka business kam ho jayega sir are you getting the point which is why this challenge has to be addressed now so the credit cycle or the payment cycle has been done in a fashion where it is neither too less for the buyer not too long for the msme or for the seller so look at this challenges for micro units 
risk of buyers preferring unregistered suppliers to avoid payment obligations because registered suppliers on Udyam portal there would be payment obligations that why have you not paid so they would go for unregistered suppliers this would reduce the business of M registered MSMEs then do you think the other MSMEs would get registered instead the, the MSMEs which are already registered they would give up on their registration example for weavers in Tamil Nadu facing payment delays and reduced payments from large buyers they are not getting payments from large buyers uh, uh, so large buyers think that they can pay after a certain point in time. Now if, if these people are forced to pay to these weavers, then they will not place the order to, the, to those weavers. They will go to an unregistered person. And that is how the business would reduce. This is the challenge that they are facing. MSMEs are a little optimistic that they believe timely payments will benefit MSMEs in the long run. Acknowledgement of temporary impact on working capital of buyers would be there because buyers would be impacted. If they had a habit of paying after 60 days, after 90 days, now they have to pay in the timeline. And the timeline that has been fixed is written agreements, mandate payment within 45 days of components, pairs or services. Whatever services have been provided, what are comp whatever components or services have been sold, you as a buyer have to pay within 45 days. So this is the mandate payment has to be done. The payment has to be made within 45 days. Without an agreement, payment should be made within 15 days. If there is no agreement, payment has to be made within 15 days. Now, 15 days time is less. 45 days time is okay. -ish. Normally, people have a habit of paying in 60 to 90 days. This is the normal time limit of payment. This time limit of payment has come down to 45 days and unregistered 15 days. So, it is better to, to deal with registered buyers only, registered buyers and registered MSMEs and pay up till 45 days. So this is what would increase the working capital of, uh, of the business and it might decrease the working capital of buyers because earlier they used to get 60 to 90 days to pay. Now they have to pay in half the time. If you have to pay in half the time, you might face a cash crunch in your business. This is what is there. So MSMEs might be benefited, might be impacted, no one knows. System expected to settle down over time. Acknowledgement of temporary disruption of to buyers working capital by V. Uh, Therunganam, President of Coimbatore District and Small Industries Association. So this is the acknowledgement of temporary disruption that temporarily things would be disrupted, sale would be affected in a temporary fashion and they are prepared for it, which is the biggest point that they are prepared for it. So here we have included the definition of MSME, you can read it MSME D Act 2006, whatever we have discussed. So you can read it from the PPT a little later, very, very important sector, uh, section, importance of MSMEs for Indian economy. I just told you. MSMEs are very high in number. They generate employment of almost 120 million people, 11, 110 to 120 million people. So the biggest benefit of MSME is that they create employment and this employment that has been created is not on the government of India. Government of India is not responsible for creating this employment. People create their employment themselves. Highly important. Followed by this, obviously, if you are creating employment, you are making something, you are providing a service, then you are earning income also. If you are earning income, that would increase GDP. GDP would increase, which would contribute to growth. It contributes to growth. Let's look at certain numbers. With around 36.1 million units throughout the graphical expanse of the country, MSMEs contribute around 6.11% of the manufacturing GDP. Just imagine, out of the total manufacturing, 6% comes from just the MSME sector and 25% approximately from the service sector. The service sector is the biggest contributor to the GDP of India. 55% GDP comes from service sector. Within that 55%, one fourth, 25% comes from the MSME sector only. So MSME ministry has set a target to up its contribution to 50% by 2025 as India becomes a $5 trillion economy. This is what India becomes and this is what is important. Hence, the MSME sector has to be supported. Just think, you, you have to support a sector not in terms of giving them, any, you're not giving them anything. You're just restructuring laws to support them. This is the best possible thing. I don't have an, as a government, I don't have an obligation to provide them with loans. I don't have the obligation to generate jobs. They are using their own brain. They are putting up their own unit, what do they need? They need a timely capital at a low rate of interest. You just have to give it to them. Give it to them as it is so much capital is given to so many people who are defaulters, Malia and Modi and who all. So give it to people who are actually doing some benefit for your economy. Are you getting the point?
And there is another very big benefit and that is whatever MSMEs manufacture, a large amount of that, that, those goods and services, they contribute to India's export. When I say they contribute to India's export, a large amount of those goods are exported, which actually gives us much needed forex capital or foreign exchange capital. So it contributes 45% of the overall exports from India. This is a massive number, massive number. So overall export of goods, if they contribute to, let's say, $500 billion, then almost half comes from the MSME sector. So look at its contribution. This is the benefit. Then comes inclusive growth. MSMEs are started at such a low level. They're started by people at a very marginal level, people who are not extremely well off. So those people are growing. It basically means it is contributing towards inclusive growth. So inclusive growth by providing employment opportunities in rural areas, especially to people belonging to weaker sections of society. If they are able to do these things, then anyone can, anyone can. This basically shows us the character of people who, if given opportunity, can do wonders. So why are people like us so lazy that we can't do these wonders? And so they are including in terms of growth, inclusive growth and obviously financial inclusion. This is the importance of the MSMEs for the Indian economy. This is how they function. Followed by this, we come to an article on geography. So not many articles on geography are there in the newspapers. They're there on certain days. So today we are talking about impact of greenhouse gases on in increasing the intensity of tropical cyclones. Basically, this is the gist of the article. We are not talking about tropical cyclones, but we'll be talking about the impact and the intensity of tropical cyclones via what? Greenhouse gases. This is what is happening. So in this particular case, what is it that we are talking about? Let's have a look. Tropical cyclones are prevalent in the tropical belt of the world. So the tropical belt of the world throughout, if you look at the entire globe, from where to where, from west to east, it's the North Atlantic, primarily the North Atlantic, followed by that, if you look at major oceans, Indian Ocean, and over here, the Pacific Ocean, all right? These are the major oceans where it is prevalent, the North Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and they prominently see the whirlwind of tropics or tropical cyclones which happens because of certain features which are contributing towards making that cyclone come and contributing towards its force with the force with which it enters. That force, all of you know, is called as Coriolis force. So what, are, what is the criteria? What are the climatic conditions required for tropical cyclones to form? All right, what is it? Let's have a look. Formation and characteristics of tropical cyclones. They form over warm tropical ocean basins with temperatures above 26.5 degrees Celsius. So they have to, they need this much warmth. The water has to be warm to the extent of 26.5 degrees. And this is something that is important for today's article for you to understand. Then there have to be strong winds. Strong winds only then the cyclone would move. Otherwise it would not move. And with heavy precipitation and storm surges, there has to be a storm, there has to be precipitation means rainfall and strong winds. And this is something that keeps on rotating due to the Coriolis force, depending it is in the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. It causes a significant damage to coastal communities and infrastructure. As soon as the cyclone hits the land, the cyclone loses its, uh, loses its uh, source of energy. The source of energy is coming from the ocean. It loses that. Which is why cyclone impacts the coastal communities and it does a lot of damage like it has done in the past. You, have, you would have seen cyclone impacting the coast of Odisha, coast of West Bengal. Um, it comes hundreds of kilometers inside and that impact of wind and precipitation comes all the way inside, hundreds of kilometers inside, inside the land, mainland, uh, uh, mainland coastal community and people are heavily impacted, lives are destroyed, a lot of damage to infrastructure is done due to cyclones. So yes, this is what happens. These are the criteria. So where are the tropical cyclones distributed across the world? They are in the North Atlantic, East Pacific, West Pacific, South Pacific and Indian Ocean. Prominently these three oceans. Western Pacific Basin is the most active region accounting for about one third of the world's tropical cyclones. 
So one third of the world's tropical cyclones are there as a part of Western Pacific Basin. North Indian Ocean accounts for only about 4% of the global total, but is highly vulnerable to cyclone effects. This is what happens in the North Indian Ocean, where, you know, where we live. So this is there. Now the issue is not this. The issue is, so all of the, this is, these are geographical facts that all of us know about cyclones. And they are created at a temperature of 26.5 degrees C. Implemented well. Now the point is that what has happened? Global warming has happened. The effect of greenhouse gases, chlorofluorocarbons has created global warming. Because of the global warming, the average temperatures have risen. Do you agree to this? The average temperatures have risen. Because of the heat, because of the average temperatures uh, uh, risen, it contributes to even heavier precipitation, heavier rainfall because more evaporation. Heavier precipitation, heavier rainfall and the winds if they move in the same fashion, the intensity of cyclone increases, the intensity, its impact, that increases because of global warming. And this is what, what is creating increase in intensity and that would further damage much more. So impact of global warming on tropical cyclones, rise in greenhouse gas emissions leading to global warming, increased ocean heat content favors intensification of tropical cyclones. So ocean heat content favors intensification of tropical cyclones, it leads to this problem. Long term data indicates increasing frequency of intense tropical cyclones. Warmer atmosphere holds more moisture leading to heavier rainfall during landfall and hence the intensity, so more water and its impact would be high. Cyclones strengthen faster and spend more time over the oceans. So this is the impact of global warming on tropical cyclones that it creates higher intensity, higher frequency and higher damage. So when we look at the future projections, obviously greenhouse gas emissions are not reducing. No country is actually focusing on, on the way they say net zero carbon emissions. They just say it's lip service, nothing is being done. Tropical cyclone Freddy is an example, recent example, recorded as the longest lived cyclone in 2023. So it was above category 5 due to global warming. Category 5 because the intensity was the highest. Proposal to introduce category 6 on SS wind scale due to increasing storm intensities. I mean, we did not have this category, but this is to be created because of because the intensity increase is increasing. Expectation of increased frequency of category 6 storms in regions prone to intense tropical cyclones. This is the implication that might happen in the future due to tropical cyclones and their implication and the implication of greenhouse gases. So I hope you like the article. It was an interesting article, yes. Now coming to the next article, it focuses on GS3, the economy section, talking about the highest unemployment in the world. Do we really care? That's the question. Do we really care about high unemployment? And if it is there, then what are we doing if the unemployment is high? What are we doing to reduce that unemployment amidst the youth? That's very important. Is something being done? Very important. So unemployment is high amidst the youth. You know why? What is the reason that has been given in this article? This is a newer take. So let's take a look. When we talk about unemployment, youth is a part of demographic dividend demography demographic dividend so demographic or demography the population that we are talking about which is in the certain age bracket let's say it is in between 25 to 45 which is primarily the youth what they are doing as a part of this entire logic whatever they are doing whatever they are uh, contributing, it is acting as a dividend. Now the problem is this demography, this part of population, this demography or this part of population, the number of people has drastically increased. Number of people has drastically increased, not just increased, it has drastically increased. Because of the heavy increase in the number of people, more youth, more demography within this age bracket, 
has actually created high unemployment. So it is not just, so if you, okay, if you say that our population is increasing, this is not the right explanation now. This article digs into what kind of population are you adding? You are adding young population to your population, to your young people to your population. When we say that we are adding younger people to our population, it is actually contributing to this particular kind and this particular problem. This is even a heavier problem. Let's have a look. So there was a, a certain statistic. I'll give you that statistic. You'll be able to appreciate what we are doing. Look at this. Working age population increased from 61% in 2011 to 64% in 2021. This is the increase in working age population. You're not talking about population, working age population, which is primarily the youth entering into the workforce from the age of, let's say, 25 and up to 45, the percentage has increased by 4%. It has not decreased. It has increased in 10 years. It is not even the same. Had it been the same, that also would have been high, but it has increased. Proportion of youth involved in economic activities have decreased from 52% to 37% between these 20 years, 2000 to 2022. It has decreased. So unemployment affects educated youth more. And this is the biggest, biggest problem. It is always said, or it was stated by the World Bank, in fact, that people who are in the youth, who have certain responsibility can work. They can do any job. The problem with educated youth is that when you receive education, your brain starts functioning at a higher level and you don't settle for any job. You don't like any job. This is a problem with everyone, including you and me. Both of us or all of us have this problem. I mean, if somebody gives you a job which you think is very lower according to your status, according to your qualification, according to your background, you will not do. You are comfortable to sit at home. We are comfortable to sit at home not doing anything but do a certain job which is actually giving us some remuneration. And this is the biggest problem, which is why unemployment amidst educated youth is much higher than uneducated youth, especially those with secondary education or higher. If you have secondary education, then employment should have been higher because you are educated, but unemployment is higher. So unemployment rate among youth tripled between 2012 and 2018. Just look at this statistic. It tripled. It became three times. So if we say that by that time there were 1 crore youth that were unemployed, today there are 3 crore youth that, were that are unemployed in, in a span of 6 years. And they are prominently educated youth. This is something that came about as a statistic that unemployment is high amidst the youth and it is even higher amidst the educated youth. This comes from International Labour Organization and Human Development. So what is it that we are focusing upon? We are focusing upon the prime reason why unemployment is high because there, if even if jobs are available, educated youth does not want to do that job because it is below their stature, below their qualification. They are looking at quality of employment. They are not looking at money somehow. So jobs remain low productive and low earning. Jobs are what? Low productive, low earning. Real wages and earnings declined or stagnated. Basically, they didn't uh, decline or stagnate. The point is inflation is high. Inflation is high, to be honest. This I don't blame the people. Most jobs, 90% in 2023, were in the informal sector, unorganized sector. Unorganized sector does not have job security. Today you can hire someone, tomorrow you can fire someone. There are no laws, there are nothing. And, and it's not just the employers. Even people like to be in the sector. If you go to a person, if you go to your market, most of the people working in a local market close to your place, that is informal sector. They don't like to be involved in formality and formal sector. Whatever you speak, the money should be given in their hand. If you say that your salary is 15,000, they should get 15,000 in their hand, not even bank account. No implication of taxes, no laws, nothing. So that is why employer also does not care about these things. So it is both the people are hand in glove together. And the government has to resolve, resolve this. Even the government does not resolve this problem because the people are happy with the sector. People are happy with the sector, which is why the unemployment is high. So the concerns are formal employment is low. 9% of total employment is formal employment. This statistic is important. You can use this in the mains examination. Gender gap is uh, with low rates of female participation. Although gender gap has narrowed, like male and female gap has narrowed, but still it is high in comparison to the West. Recommendations include making production and growth more employment intensive, improving job quality, overcoming labor market inequalities, skills training, promoting entrepreneurship, 
all of these things should be done these are the recommendations this is something that you have to write also a part of gs1 social issues also a part of gs paper 1 social issues it urges the government to increase agricultural productivity that it creates more non farm jobs and promote women's participation in the labor force so women's participation in the labor force has to increase and this has to be done these are the concerns and recommendations that have come about in order to increase formal employment in order to increase the gender gap thing which is actually impacting the people so i hope you have understood this particular article it was a very insightful article a very very good article now coming to the last article of today this is an article focusing on environment gs3 as well as prelims some part of prelims so there is something by the name of a global biodiversity framework gbf and this biodiversity framework was established by two separate protocols in two separate regions one was in the montreal region montreal is in canada there was a montreal protocol long back it was done 20 years back and then there came about a protocol that was done in kunming region of china so kunming kunming montreal gbf so what did they come up with what were the targets what did they set out and how we are trying to achieve that so kunming and montreal were separate things now they have been combined in order to make a framework and this has been done very recently as a part of conference of parties cop you might have read if you are reading newspapers regularly you might have read about cop summit the most popular cop summit that you would have read about was in paris where donald trump famously stated that there is nothing known as climate change there is nothing called as climate change unko lagta hai climate change nahi hota hai so adopted during the 15th meeting of cop conference of parties to the un convention on biodiversity in 2022 so the un convention on biodiversity in 2022 this was adopted at this point in time it aims to increase the so look how they are trying to focus on environment or protect the environment by increasing the protected areas protected areas which means the greenery wildlife this is what they are trying to trying to protect wildlife national parks protected areas to at least 30% of the world's terrestrial area by 2050 so this is what they they are trying to increase this area that on if the area is already if area is already large they are trying to protect that area more that there should be uh, no uh, not much infiltration there should be not much development all of these things they are trying to do this is something that they are they are that the target is amidst other targets so there are in totality 23 targets as a part of this particular gbf this particular summit that happens that happened as a part of cop i'm just showing you the graphic you can read this graphic in from the ppt later i am focusing on the goals it includes four goals and 23 targets for achievement by 2030 highly impossible we are already in 2024 un conference of parties biodiversity conference concluded in canada's montreal this was done long back montreal is in canada the first part of cop 15 took place in kunming china and reinforced the commitment to address biodiversity crisis so this was done hence both of them came together to make kunming montreal gbf this framework was adopted according to this framework 30 cross 30 deal restore 30% degraded ecosystems globally on land and sea by 2030 30% degraded ecosystem has to restore it is good if they are able to restore even let's say half of what they are promising conserve and manage 30% areas terrestrial inland water and coastal and marine by 2030 this has to be conserved you have to memorize these two objectives of these this particular global biodiversity framework this has to be remembered it is highly important looking at this the implications are what are the implications when i say that the protected areas have to increase now what do you think there is a jungle area there is a protected area who inhabits that forest area that core area within the forest those national parks those tiger reserves who inhabits that area this particular area is inhabited prominently by the tribal community the adivasi community when i say that the tribal community adivasi community it inhabits this area 
this area if it has to be protected or the area has to increase there would be infiltration or let's say not infiltration is not the right word there would be influx of the outside authorities which would impact the tribal communities normal life the way they have been living and there is a purpose they are living over there because they don't want to get out of there even after getting so many benefits from the government right so majority of india's national parks established in areas are inhabited by indigenous people aboriginals tribals upgrading of wildlife sanctuaries if you are upgrading wildlife sanctuaries to tiger reserves because this would protect them more wildlife sanctuaries are less protected tiger reserves are more protected and expansion of protected areas threaten tribal villages if you expand the protected area it would threaten the tribal villages because there would be influx of people which they are fearful of activists advocate recognition of indigenous rights and protection of tribal lands the rights have to be protected and the indigenous rights have to be recognized this is what the activists are saying which is absolutely true the ministry of tribal affairs and the activists and the ngos who are working for them for their favor this is what they have been saying so gbf's impact on india has been working since then so looking at this and its impact is something that we worry about so what are the implications indigenous communities fear loss of land and livelihoods due to gbf targets concerns raised about corporate exploitation of forest resources and the exposure of indigenous rights so at the exposure of indigenous rights this has to be protected this has to be done well example cited of human rights violation in protected areas human rights violation have been happened have happened in protected areas already uh, and obviously if human rights violation are happening then who is being violated whose rights are being violated the tribal's rights which is actually a bigger cause of concern so it includes denial of housing health education all these things have already been seen so looking at this should we not so now the question is should we not conserve biodiversity because it is impacting the tribal communities uh, uh, living standard of living or the way of living should we not do it now this is the question this question has to be resolved which is why the recommendations are that protect the tribals first tribals lands and tribals way of living their indigenous way of living has to be protected so in short tribals are custodians of protected areas and this can only happen by a law and address human rights violations with protected areas for this law has to be passed and not a normal law a tribal specific human rights violation law advocate for equal treatment of tribal and non tribal areas in pa designation and address human rights violations seriously and to right to pre prior and informed consent for indigenous communities you need their consent just like i mean you need the consent of people of farmers if you are acquiring their land similarly if you are getting in the tribal area you need you should uh, acquire their uh, acceptance for you to be able to enter that area these are certain recommendations you can include these recommendations as a part of your answer a very very so i mean the you, the way we are discussing an article i hope you are able to understand it is a ready made answer the issue the problems with that issue and then the recommendations or the way forward this is how i teach current affairs all right now certain things with respect to prelims that are important that you should be knowing so bihu festival you know about bihu festival um, it is celebrated in assam from april 13th to mark the beginning of the assamese new new year a very popular bohag bihu festival all our friends from assam many congratulations Bihu is a folk dance of Assam. Nearly sixty acres of forest were uh, 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 were affected by a major fire, ostensibly triggered by some unidentified miscreants at Biligiri Ranganathan Swami Temple Tiger Reserve in Karnataka. So this is hap this happened over here, Biligiri Rama Swami Temple Wildlife Sanctuary. So you have to remember its location. It is in Karnataka. It is not in Tamil Nadu. It is not in Kerala. and one more prelims related thing is that is important is monkey pox again it has come it has hit in animals reveal correlates of protection so it is an infectious disease caused by the monkey pox virus it can cause a painful rash and large lymph nodes and fever this even happens amidst humans and it is most prevalent amidst small kids babies so mpox vaccines in animals reveal correlates of protection that it can be protected but let's see let's see what happens as a part of this bihu festival Main questions. Have a look at the questions. They have been framed on today's articles. Explain explain the purpose of Green Grid Initiative launched at the World Leaders Summit of COP twenty six UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. When was the idea first floated in the International Solar Alliance (ISA)? 
convention. When was it first quoted? You have to answer this in 150 words, whatever we have just studied as a part of environment. Describe the key points. Second, of the received revived global air quality guidelines recently released by the World Health Organization, how are these different from its last update in 2005? What changes in India's national clean air program are required to achieve these revised targets? This is something that you have to write on the basis of what we have studied today. I mean, this is a broader question. It is also talking about national clean air program of India, which we have not discussed explicitly today. But the other things plus this question can be used to answer the question that we have discussed. So, I hope you appreciated today's newspaper. Sunday's newspaper, we have multiple articles and the prelims bites were important. In fact, the articles that we have discussed, all of them are important. So, I hope you enjoyed the class. Do subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much. And check out for the regular national scholarship tests and the batches that Baiju Zazan is announcing. Thank you so much everyone. Bye. Take care and all the best.